As many of us know, not all war stories have fairy tale endings. For every man who managed to completely avoid the dangers around him and come out of the war unscathed, there were thousands upon thousands more that were less fortunate and who happened to be caught by machine gun fire and shrapnel, inflicted by disease, frostbitten by the cold, burned in tanks and planes, and a variety of other horrific injuries that posed an immediate threat to the victim's life. And so, when these men on the front lines inevitably began succumbing to the hellfire around them, a new front line emerged. A front line consisting of men and women whose job it was to preserve as much life as they could on the battlefield, whilst facing the exact same dangers as their fallen brothers. These people, of course, were the combat medics of the war an underrated and underfeatured part of World War II that we here on the front aim to change in today's video. First, I figured I'd cover the poster child for today's video, that of course being Desmond Doss of the 77th Infantry Division. For those of you unaware of the context behind this story, Doss was a conscientious objector who refused to carry a gun in World War II, ultimately earning him the scorn of his peers and commanding officers alike, who did the very best they could to bully him out of the army. Doss, however, would not budge. Being a devout Seventh-day Adventist, he was a firm believer in the Sixth Commandment and the words, Thou shall not kill. Yet, he was still devoted to his country and wanted to serve in the war as a combat medic saving lives instead of taking them, thus not wanting to touch a gun. Despite several attempts to intimidate him out of the army as well as court-martial him, the scrawny Virginian got his way and was sent off to fight a war with the desperate Japanese Empire defending to their last man. In May of 1945, Doss and the men of the 77th Infantry Division were sent to take one of the last remaining strongholds of the Japanese before a potential mainland invasion, a stronghold nicknamed Hacksaw Ridge. In saying all that, the fighting was, understandably, some of the fiercest of the war, and on May 5th, 1945, the Japanese launched such a devastating counterattack that only one third of the initial fighting force made it back down the ridge, with the rest either dead or left for dead above. One man, however, disobeyed officers' orders to retreat and stayed behind to rescue as many men as he could. The combat medic, who probably never weighed more than 145 pounds, managed to save at least 75 souls from imminent execution at the hands of the Japanese that day, and for his heroic actions on the ridge, received a medal of honor, to this day being one of only very few conscientious objectors to ever do so. It's Russia 1941. The Germans have switched their sights from England after their defeat at the Battle of Britain and now set them upon an unprepared and under-equipped Soviet Union. Panicked, Stalin and his top generals mobilize as many men and women as possible to halt the stampeding Germans and slow their advance by any means necessary. With this many bodies on the line, many inevitably fall, and it was up to Red Army medics like Yevdokia Simchonok to pick as many back up as possible. With the Russians losing so many battles in the first few weeks, freight trains of wounded began to arrive, with three levels of racks being built to hold them all. Simchonok and her colleagues recognized a few Germans that had slipped onto these trains and treated them no different. In these early stages, she barely had time for sleep, as some surgeries, such as ones for abdominal wounds, took almost 18 hours to complete. Although initially starting further out in the back line, as the Battle of Stalingrad came around, Siemchonok was only 8 miles away from the main battlefront and was in constant danger. Yet, despite constant breaks in the Soviet line coming extremely close to her positions, she and her other medical orderlies kept working tirelessly to revive and care for severely wounded soldiers. 
As the war progressed and the Germans were finally getting pushed back, the danger was still not over and many German counterattacks and Red Army casualties led Siemchonuk to have three or four day streaks without any food or sleep. Her boots had holes in them and conditions were absolutely atrocious. Regardless, she managed to push through to the German surrender in 1945, surviving the war a changed woman. On June 6, 1944, Elsley Folds was one of many Canadians to land at Juno Beach and begin to chip away at Germany's stranglehold on Western Europe. Serving with the 22nd Canadian Field Ambulance at the time of the historic landings, Fould was a combat medic, unarmed and equipped with only a medical kit, some bandages and Red Cross bands on each arm to signify his status as a medic. Despite common misconceptions that Omaha was the only tough beach on D-Day, Juno came at a close second and was also very well defended by the Germans, with the 14,000 Canadians who landed there taking heavy casualties. According to Fould's, you were scared, but you didn't really have time to be scared. You had a job to do, and quite the job he did do, running around the beach and stabilizing as many wounded men as he could find under a constant barrage of machine gun fire from desperate German defenders. Finally, the Canadians broke through, and Fools managed to stick with them all the way through to the end of the war in Germany, patching up thousands of men and saving hundreds of lives on their fight toward Berlin. Thankfully, this story does have a happy ending, and not only did the Canadians survive it all and receive France's highest honour, the Légion d'Honneur, for his noble participation in D-Day, but he also met the love of his life later, during the liberation of Holland, and settled down to raise 10 kids over a 70-year marriage. A farm boy from Ballarat, Victoria, Leslie Charles Allen or Bull Allen as he would come to be known by his mates was a powerfully built character with a slight disdain for authority. Despite his constant run-ins with officers, Allen garnered respect by being an incredibly tough soldier and stretcher bearer. Beginning his career in the Syrian campaign of 1941, Allen had already made an impression on the men he fought with by tending to casualties all night long during a particularly bloody part of the battle, as well as walking 10 kilometers the next morning, although fatigued, to get transport for those wounded on the front lines. Later on in the war, Allen's company was sent to the Pacific Theater, and it was there where he really showed everybody what he was made of. Among many other things during his stint in the Pacific, the true immortalization of Allen came on the 30th of July, 1943 at Mount Tambu, New Guinea. It was here, under intense Japanese fire after a vicious counterattack, that Allen still went in to save severely wounded members of an American company. Despite being a big target for the Japanese and being wounded himself, Allen kept going back and carrying one American after another to safety, ultimately saving 12 lives before collapsing from extreme exhaustion and blood loss. Allen survived the experience, as did the 12 Americans, but he was never the same again. An embodiment of all the brave Polish medics of the Polish underground army during the Warsaw Uprising, Anna Zakszewska saw 11 days of intense fighting while acting as a courier and a medical orderly before she was killed by machine gun fire. Zakszewska earned her place on this list by helping her battalion hold down a school building that had just been taken back from the German captors. She and the other nurses played an integral role in holding this important command post for as long as possible by distributing orders, ammunition and meals, as well as taking care of the men wounded in the initial assault. Eventually, the pressure became too much for the Polish to hold and they were forced to evacuate, where it was during this evacuation that Anna was unfortunately struck by bullets and killed. A 32-year-old Lance Corporal in the Royal Army Medical Corps Henry Eric Harden was a source of inspiration and courage for the younger troops in his command, acting almost as a fatherly figure to the men. On the 23rd of January 1945, Harden, one of the most senior medical orderlies on the front lines, was to show his men the definition of bravery and honor during an operation in the Netherlands. Attached to a commando troop, the operation from the get-go was looking pretty grey, and three commandos had already fallen prey to the devastating German machine gun fire 
all three being seriously wounded. Despite Hardin himself also being wounded, he was a man on a mission and didn't let this stop him from bringing back the first casualty to the first aid post. Against the orders of another medical officer, Hardin went back into the hellfire of battle with the stretcher party intended to get the other two men out of the danger zone. Coming under intense machine gun fire and mortar fire, the second man they picked up was killed during transport, and thus the men all went back for the last man alive. And while helping transport him back to the first aid post, Hardin was this time the unlucky one, and was shot through the head and killed instantly. Hardin left behind a wife, two kids, and was awarded a Victoria Cross for his actions on the battlefield. Awarded a Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, one of the highest German military decorations of World War II, Franz Schmitz was a hero of the Eastern Front. Staying true to the Hippocratic Oath, Schmitz was intent on saving every life he physically could on the Eastern Front, whether they be the lives of his own kind or the lives of Russians. As a medical officer in the 279th Grenadier Regiment, Schmitz was estimated to have cared for and rescued over 2,000 German wounded on the battlefronts he fought on. In addition to the numerous Russian soldiers he would help that were isolated on the battlefield away from sight. As the war went on, Schmitz himself became wounded several times. And luckily for him, however, his guardian angel was watching over him one of those times when he was sent to hospital in Germany at the opportune time during March of 1945, where upon his dismissal, he was captured by the Americans instead of the Russians. Due to his impeccable service record and multiple awards from the Wehrmacht, the Americans quickly established he was not a war criminal of any sort, and he was released on June 25th, 1945. After his release, Schmitz went on to continue his military career in the West German Bundeswehr before he retired in 1962, living a relatively peaceful life until his death in 1985, unfortunately just missing out on the reunification of Germany. So guys, that was my little dedicated video about the medics of World War II. And surprisingly, there's not a lot known about medics in World War II. Their jobs are pretty much overshadowed by the absolute magnitude of the war. And we simply just don't hear much about them compared to the medics, say, in World War I, which do actually get quite a bit of recognition. So if you guys know any other medics in World War II that I may have missed, and if you can get seven more for me, then I can potentially do a part two of this video. So make sure you let me know in the comments section below because this video was surprisingly hard to research and I'm not sure if there are any other good sources for seven more medics from different countries out there, but if there are, make sure you let me know. And just quickly before you go guys, I wanna say a big thank you to all of my new patrons helping to grow the army. Specifically, I'd like to thank my three current generals, Trigu, Rudy H and Twash. So thank you guys so much. Your support really helps a channel like this, which is always in the gray area of YouTube's monetization system. So in saying that, any dollar really does help guys. And I can't say enough how much patron support means to us on this channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.